up in Montana, did everyone watch Hannah Montana? I actually, so my hometown didn't get the Disney Channel. <laughs> what? Like, I, yeah, like in our cable package, unless you had satellite, you did not get Disney Channel in my hometown. So we had like Nickelodeon, uh, Cartoon Network. So that was like the big thing. You could watch Hannah Montana on like ABC on like Sunday afternoons, but like it's not like, you know, we could we could watch it. I'd have to I'd have to go to my grandma's. That's how I watch Hannah Montana. <laughs> Is there did you kinda like like that was like cool, a show named after Montana or like Not really I mean like it wasn't no. we, we, I wasn't that into it. I, I liked it. it. It became like like I liked it, but it wasn't like I made that connection. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like they're they're in Malibu, California. So. Yeah, yeah. They weren't they weren't showing out for us. You know, it wasn't Yellowstone. <laughs> Yellowstone's shit, you know? I still haven't seen Yellowstone. I, I, I mean, neither. I was it like, because I grew up in Alaska, so I can imagine there's some similarities. Because um, you grew up in a small town? Yeah, yeah. What's the population? I was like 6,000. I think it's like 7,000 now. It's growing. That's that's super small. That's like village-esque. Like, or maybe just small town, but like... Yeah, yeah. But was it like moving to Phoenix? Did you, was it like a shock? I mean, a little bit, uh, you know, like I, I went, like I said, like we were, it was a small town, but we were right next to Billings, which is like population, like a hundred, five thousand. That's not impressive. It's, I mean, it's big. <laughs> it's big, it's biggest city in the state. Yeah. Uh, and then like I went to school, like town of like, I think 70,000. Um, so, you know, it was, it, yeah, it was definitely like a shock, uh, just because, you know, we you know, I'm used to, I, I, like, when I was in college, I walked everywhere. Uh, it was, like, that close. Like, I mean, like, I, you know, I didn't have a car. So, like, I mean, like, I was walking to dentist appointments. I was walking, like, to work. So, you know, it, it, I didn't have the need for a car. And then, like, coming down here, it's like, I could, I could drive 30 minutes to work. Like, that's... Well, since everything is low population, I assume everything would be kind of more spread out. Because you can't, you don't have the privilege of having, like... 13 planet fitnesses and then like within like a 20 mile radius so is this did they make sure everything was like in a hub or did you have to like did you have to take those like 30 minute drives or like walk a while to get somewhere uh so i mean like it was nice because i was nearby campus so like when i was like in school so like the gym everything like that was like you know half mile away uh and then you know like uh work i worked a mile away um, so I mean, really outside of that and like I had a grocery store, uh, that was, you know, it was, it was a local grocery store less than like half a block from my house. It was like very convenient. Uh, so I mean, outside of like stuff that I needed, like, like I said, like when I had to go to the dentist, I had to walk a little bit further, but for the most part, like, I mean, like I was, I, I was right there, you know, I had everything I needed basically within like a mile mile and a half radius it was you know location when you live in a good like good area that, that helps out a lot my fresh or sophomore year I was in the middle I, I don't want to say middle of nowhere but I mean like I was uh I wasn't really by anything convenient like I was next to the movie theater um uh, so I I was having to drive a lot and then you know thankfully my car didn't break down that year broke broke down the year after uh and so i mean it was it was good it was, you know i, I made do when you're because i played i played ball in alaska and then I, when we when i would go to smaller places like juno alaska mm -hmm. carlos boozer um <laughs> like represent represent gang gang they actually have like a huge photo of him <laughs> i gym. believe it yeah so but for that um because I noticed the whole thing, like, I played in Juno, and then, like, the whole town would come, and then, like, they'd be threatening these 17-year-old kids, like, yeah. screw you! Yeah. It's just like, ah, this is great. <laughs> what? How is it? Because you played ball, right? Yeah, yeah, And yeah. you're, like, six foot one, six foot two. so were you, like, you were a center, right? I'm six four, by the way. Oh, you're six four. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no, I was a center. Uh, I was an undersized center, for sure. Like, I mean, like, we had, I mean... You wouldn't think about it for Montana, but like we had, you know, some kids in the conference like six ten, uh, six eight, you know, a couple six sevens, and so I mean, 
it was fairly big, but you know when you when you got long arms, it helps out a lot. <laughs> no, because I heard somebody was talking about like because he played in all the league except for NBA. Of course, he played like in the Euro League, and he said the major jump when you go up from like JUCO D one two. I'm sorry, D three two one is the big men get more a lot more physical. You know, the guards yeah. of course increase in skill, but now you have someone that's like two sixty seven foot instead of a six foot four. Yeah. 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 No, I uh, I did. I, I went on uh, I registered my freshman year uh, college I went to a small NAI school and like the guys uh, I, I you know I was just practicing but like I mean like the guys like I meet up at like open gyms or like the guys I was guarding in practice like 6'8", 240 uh, one of my good buddies at the time he was like 6'7", 250 just like a monster of a man like I'd, I'd go out uh, I went out with him in bars and I have never felt safer in a bar. Like, I mean, like, just, like, being around him, like, going out with him, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna, like, I mean, like, no one's, no one's gonna mess with us. It, it was a, uh, so much safety. It was, it was a good feeling. <laughs> it's definitely, do you notice, like, because I always thought sometimes when I got more into the basketball scene, because I didn't get more into, like, the creative space that I am now, because it's just, like, when you're just hanging out with hoopers, all they do is hoop. They don't really have a personality outside of that sometimes. Mm. What did you guys mainly do, like, in downtime? Uh, like, I mean, we'd watch... This was when Vine was big, so, like, I mean, that's, like, what a lot of us connected on. Uh, like, the younger guys, like, we would just watch Vines all day and, like, send each other Vines, you know? Uh, so that was, like, the big connection that we had. And it was it was a weird thing, but, like, that really, like, introduced me to comedy. I mean, like, I had been introduced to comedy, uh, but, like, just being introduced to the fact that, like, you know, people can do it you know I mean it doesn't really matter where you're at because I'm sure it was similar for you but like when you're when you're growing up like in an area that's not you know LA not New York not even like a big city you know being able to like realize like you have creative outlets like that that's uh that's a big thing because you know you don't you don't really think about that when you're growing up like you know you can work at like the you can work at the steel mill you can work at the refinery yeah. and like that's like it's like oh that's like what you got to do but you don't really realize like oh shit there's other options out there yeah i think the hard part when you're kind of like that outsider like kind of it's like troy from high school musical when you yeah. want to get into the arts yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just really finding that community because it's super, i think personally it was hard it's hard to do it by yourself yeah um like when i got i don't know i just i wasn't heavy like i'm gonna post this and this but like i remember looking for an improv and then I put it in my GPS without realizing it was in New York and I was in Alaska. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, oh, shit. Like, it's not, it's just not available sometimes. Yeah. Um, what was like, was there, did you kind of know, like, were you always, because I think there's a time when people realize, like, athletes, like, all right, this is probably it for my basketball. Did you, were you kind of evident on that or were you kind of like still stretching it out? Yeah, I mean, like, it was probably like the first week of like open gyms because, like, I was realizing like how much work I would have to put into playing basketball Mm -hmm. and then you know I I went through it you know I lifted a ton like I mean like I'm 170 pounds now that's probably like my natural weight I I, like I got up to like 215 that's Uh, thick on it I I was big thick I think it's hard to do that because I I started lifting because I thought I wasn't gonna make the basketball team Mm -hmm. and I actually got up to like 210 which is like as a 18 year old like mm-hmm. that's like a lot but then I sprinted so much I got I cut down to 170 because mm-hmm. like just so much sprinting mm-hmm. how is it how are you 210 sprinting all the time how was that well I wasn't sprinting as much as I needed to <laughs> <laughs> like I mean like I was lifting and I was eating you know like I was I was eating a ton like I was eating probably like four or five meals a day mm-hmm. and then on top of that I was eating protein sh- or drinking protein shakes uh, so I mean like it it was not it was nice like I mean like it was cool but like you know to be that big because like I mean like I've been scrawny all my life uh you know like I think when I came into high school I was like six four hundred fifty pounds that's like concerning like <laughs> yeah yeah no I was I had a weird body uh so like it was like you know just getting up that big that was interesting uh but you know it required a lot of work and then you know I was going to open gyms I was doing shooting you know sometimes like twice a day uh you know more like so going from like lifting shooting going to work going to open gym and then 
you know, sometimes lifting again after that. That was like that sounds nice because uh, I only compare because I like I think mine is like a lesser extent of yours. But I tried after the season getting back into lifting and then you know, you know, shooting five hundred shots a day mm-hmm. or making all those buckets. And then like my back would just get in knots because from yeah. like, that motion. So I was like, I can't do this. Like, yeah, yeah. It, I I mean like I was doing physical labor too. Like I was working in construction. Uh, so that was like. I was miserable. Like, that was a terrible summer. Like, I mean, like, it got to the point. I had an agreement. This was, like, it, it was, uh, it was a, I don't, I don't want to say bad situation, but, I mean, it was good. Uh, it was good for me in the long run, but, like, uh, you know, just knowing that I was having to go in early to lift, I had an agreement with my employer where I was, like, basically, like, I'm like, yeah, I got to lift in the morning and uh they were like okay uh they're like yeah come in whenever you need it so like I mean like I started using that where I was initially I was like coming in at like 8 a.m uh after a workout so I was like waking up at 6 lifting and then getting to work like maybe like 15 minutes late as the summer progressed I started like lifting and then just like I'm like I'm gonna wait till 10 uh to come in and it was just like it was so much it was way too much so that was that summer was like really like the biggest thing where I was like academically how are you doing I was okay you know I mean like I wasn't I wasn't flourishing by any means but I was studying the wrong thing like I was in business at the time uh I had it in my head I was like I want to be an accountant you know uh anyway I, I mean like my goal at the time was uh I'm gonna live and die in Billings Montana so uh, I didn't see a problem with that, but like as soon as I started studying it, I struggled with it, and I was like, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. Uh, so that was like a big moment for me, just because like uh, not only did it point out that I need to get away, and then also pointed out to me that like I can't do something I'm not interested in. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna be happy, and I I really wasn't happy like when I was there. So, I made a change. What did you change to? I changed to journalism, mm-hmm. and then I transferred schools to University of Montana in Missoula. Go Grizz. Um, how was it like switching over? Because I think like the one thing I always like is just, you know, find something you could just get lost in without having to like feel like mm-hmm. I gotta do this. And I know, of course, to an extent, like everything becomes like it can become a chore to do it sometimes when you don't feel like doing it. Mm-hmm. With journalism, you're like, I'm going to be Peter Parker or like... <laughs> no, I got in my head I was going to be like a, basically like a small town news reporter. So I got into broadcast. Like they basically give you options. Uh, you can, you know, you can pursue radio, you can pursue broadcast, or you can pursue print. Uh, I worked at the school newspaper. It was fun. You know, I enjoyed it. I got to write uh, some interesting stories. I was on the sports team. Uh, so that was, that was really fun. I got to cover, uh, I was on the women's basketball beat, uh, and then track and field. That's like mainly what I covered. So, uh, it was good. Uh, but you know, when you're, I, I got, I, I, I realized pretty quickly that I need to move to a city cause that's when I started getting into stand up, and then, you know, I stand up was like such a valuable part of my life. I didn't want to lose that move into a small town. And a lot of like journalism, you gotta move to a small town. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta spend time, like it was like Great Falls, uh, Bozeman, Billings, or Missoula. Those were like our four broadcast stations. So uh, I knew probably wasn't the best fit for me, at least, at least in my age, like I'll probably retire back there at some point. Well, yeah, cause I think there's people, I forgot, um this one comic he's actually I think he's in Montana or he says like he's just because at the point in comedy now you don't need to stay like in New York or something like that he just Mm -hmm. lives there and he goes on the road he just leaves Mm -hmm. so I think yeah it's a tough place to if you're a road comic it's a difficult place to be because flights are insanely expensive like because we don't we don't have a lot of direct flights uh arizona is like actually like one of our direct flights but it's thursday tuesday and sunday oh those specific days yeah yeah so uh that was a large reason why i came down here it's just you know we got the direct flight i can get back home if i need be uh but 
Yeah, it's it's a tough place to be if you want to get out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think yeah, because Alaska, if we went to go to New York, yeah, yeah, that's like eight hundred thousand eight hundred dollars. Where if I went to go to New York right now, probably I could find a ticket for one hundred twenty bucks round trip. Yeah, yeah. No, I I imagine like with Alaska, it's got to be it's got to be insane because like, you're not getting direct flights anywhere. Like I mean, outside of like Seattle. No, you always got to drop in Seattle most yeah. of the time. Yeah. But yeah, my, my brother, he's looking at other property. He's looking at other places to live and he's thinking of El Paso. And the downside of that is not a major airport hub. So it's so expensive to fly in there. Mm-hmm. So that's why I kind of think of now, like when you live, when I live, if I want to move somewhere, it's like how, like how much tra- is it going to be easy to fly there? Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. And I mean, like uh, when I was living in Missoula, I'd drive to Seattle if I wanted to fly somewhere else. Like I, I went out to Europe uh, one summer drove all the way to Seattle, had a uh, fam- uh, friend and uh, s- basically stayed with her and uh, parked my car there. Uh, so that that was good. But, and you know, same thing when I was living in uh, Laurel, just outside of Billings, drive down to Denver, that's nine hours. Yeah. That's, that's tough when you gotta get into it. Like we used to drive down to Denver all the time to fly out of places. And with El Paso, I mean, you're not, you're, you're what probably same thing like you're driving like eight hours just before you can get to a major airport i think that's the cost when i think of like sometimes i think we went to me and my wife went to mexico mm-hmm. and it's just kind of like we could drive because like we can go from cali and that's like four hundred dollars cheaper but then again it's just like is it worth me like do i buy is four hundred dollars worth six hours of me driving it's just kind of like that cost mm-hmm. but i feel like nine hours i would pay like, I yeah pay. yeah when did you first get into a uh, stand-up or you kind of like were the people around you because you talked about kind of like being the one creative person kind of right. yeah I mean like it was a uh, it was really in high school uh, I used to we don't have comedy clubs in Montana we just got one in Bozeman uh, last best comedy is what it's called but like uh, just got one so like when I was in high school my mom she liked going to comedy uh, so you know I was under 18 uh, but I was big, so I mean, like, I could, you know, they'd sneak me into a lot of these places and just say, no, he's not 21, they didn't ask if I was 18, uh, so, you know, I'd go to a lot of comedy shows with her, uh, I saw Ali Wong, she was, right. like, one of the first people I saw, and they'd have local, uh, local guys, like, open for, uh, you know, these headlining comedians, so that was, like, really cool, because it gave me like a perspective that you don't like you can do comedy you know you can you can do it like these were people that were living in Billings uh I actually it's it's kind of cool because like I ended up becoming friends with a lot of the people who I saw for the first time uh and like had that realization so like being able to like come in and you know see people from my area that were doing comedy that was like a huge realization uh for me so that's how I got introduced to it and that's really like what told me I could do it but you know I always wanted to do it and you know just never thought I would do it basically you know I I figured it's like ah you know it's it's a pipe dream I definitely I don't know I feel there's like both I don't know because you talked about kind of jobs earlier and I kind of feel like I'm at that point where it's like I feel like I want to do comedy, but I don't have to be broke at the same time. Like, I feel like a lot of people that I've seen or listened to, like, they actually have, like, a very successful career, and they do stand-up at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, that seems cool. Like, I just don't have to do DoorDash. Like, I I could be making figures. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's as long as you have, like, a day job with it, like, I mean, it's it's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to find something where you can be, uh, you know, if you want to get to the point where you're, like, going on the road, you got to be a little bit more mobile. Um, but yeah, it's good. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting craft for sure. Where do you think you are right now in your, your stand-up journey? Uh, you know, I, that's a tough question because like, you know, there's no blueprint for stand-up. Mm-hmm. You know, there are people that headline now that didn't start until they were like thirties, you know, late forty or early forties sometimes. So you know, I, I think I'm where I need to be for me because, you know, with stand up, like a lot of it is like, 
you know, you, you got to be on your own journey too, because you're writing by yourself, mm-hmm. you know, so you have to find something that's like personal to you. Uh, so I mean like I'm where I, where I need to be, I think in life. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that you, <laughs> you gotta be like on your own journey. That's kind of like what I'm getting at is, uh, so I mean like I'm on, I'm, how do you look at growth in um, stand up? Cause how long have you been doing it for? So I, it's been five years total. Uh, but you know, I started out in Montana. I did it for about two and a half years up there. So, you know, I'm only getting up once or twice a week during that time frame. So I, I look at it kind of like a hobbyist cause that's probably what I'd be considered in Phoenix. You know, if I'm only getting up once or twice a week, uh, or just about anywhere, you know, you're basically considered a hobbyist if you're getting up once or twice a week. So, um, I'm five years in total, but you know, I don't like to, I don't like to say that I'm five years in. No, yeah, it's definitely, that's what I was kind of curious when I first started. I was like, what is like, what do you consider? Cause if like, you know, like I've been doing comic comedy for like 10 years, but you know, you didn't do it from like Oh five to 2009. Mm-hmm. So like, what do you really count it as? Like if you just go up once, yeah. you're grinding. But I was kind of like thinking as perspective cause at least I think anything I look at like my past works I'm just like that's cringy I don't want to listen to it right where do you see like a difference between yourself at your year three and year five I think now I talk about uh like I I speak on stage more like I do in reality Mm -hmm. you know like I mean early on I had like a very distinct uh way that I'd speak that was very different from how I was in like everyday conversation. Uh, so like lately I feel like I've, I, I, you know, I, I, I speak like this mm-hmm. and you know, I've started doing that a little bit more on stage. Uh, I definitely feel the vibrations in the club when you speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I used to, I used to, when I get nervous, it's just like a, just, just something I've always done. Like my voice gets lower. And, uh, when I first started out, I I was incredibly nervous. So my voice would just get lower out of a nervous twitch. And I just ran with it and, you know, uh, started kind of playing to it. And it's, it's not really something I do anymore, but going back listening to it there are definitely times I'm like my voice isn't that deep uh so uh I've had to you know I've had to adjust I've had to learn from it mm-hmm. how, um, how is it as far as community wise that you've noticed from like Missoula Montana um just oh, your shirt says Missoula that's why I said Missoula pie hole baby pie hole no what do you think because people always talk about like the Phoenix scene and some people are like it's shitty but I'm like it's I, I can't compare it to anything but I'm like it's fun to me um, Missoula was interesting because, uh, you know, I was starting off in a scene where it's very progressive. Uh, we had a lot of women. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of LGBTQ. Uh, you know, the first time I met trans people was in Missoula, and it was through comedy. So um, it's a little bit more, I don't want to say progressive, but I mean, like, it, it, it was a little bit more you know, open to having different cultures. And that's interesting in a community where it's like pretty much white, Mm -hmm. you know, we had a couple, uh, native Americans, but for the most part, it's a very mayonnaise community. Uh, so, you know, coming down here, it's, it was a little bit different because like, I mean, like I was hearing people saying like, different things, like the first couple weeks, like, I mean, like I was hearing like bitch as a punchline uh and it 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 took a little bit to adjust to i mean that's not really what i try to do but you know just hearing it and being around it it's different it's different for sure yeah it's definitely it's not because you don't curse much or at all do you i curse but not a lot no i try to be as clean and clean as i can be yeah i don't know so yeah they say like I try to be like, not like I'm PG, but it's just like, I like to be able to like where the, the crux of the joke isn't mm. you know, just saying fuck, but, um, yeah, yeah. Now, where do you, uh, do you like want to be in Phoenix for like a while 
Oh, you bought a house here, though. I bought a house, but I mean, it's by a university, by Sloan Park, so uh, go Cubs, go. Uh, but, like, I can, you know, I can rent it out if need be. Mm-hmm. And that was that was a large reason behind it, is I was just trying to, you know, figure out what I want to do. And it's, it's an investment, so. Do you see yourself wanting to, like, like dip into to any other creative endeavors? So I do improv, and I love the hell out of improv. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's a really good creative outlet, just not only for, and we did improv together. Mm-hmm. So I mean, like when you're going through stand up, it's nice to have something that is creative and comedy, but not stand up. So I mean, I I love that, uh, and I you know I I don't know if I'll pursue it to the same extent I am stand up, but you know I'm getting shows just about every week in improv and that that's nice i i love the hell out of that but uh i think it's a good like filler because i'm not doing as many shows as you but you know for those saturday nights or like like i'm not having a show like let me just still do something creatively to like kind of like Mm -hmm. make sure i'm on my on my toes Mm -hmm. and and, uh dave at improv mania is really good about like the fact like i'll normally be able to do stand up after i do improv which that's a whole other beast because one like everyone's seeing you like on stage beforehand and then it's also an improv show so like people aren't going there to see stand-up so that's just a different type of crowd to work with yeah what is like what is like something you enjoy about improv though because i feel like it's a different beast i feel like a lot of comics when they do stand-up i'm sorry when they do improv it's very weird for them because Mm -hmm. they're like they just want to say like daffodil vagina and then like yeah. force laughter instead of like let the scene play out. How is it? How is it for you transitioning? I think it's interesting because like you have to be a little bit more grounded in improv, whereas like stand up, like I mean, like you're expected to be funny, but like uh, improv, you're expected to be funny too. But it requires that grounded scene, and I think that's uh, helped out a lot with stand up because like you can't just be punchline, punchline, punchline. Like you uh, at least where I'm at now that's my interpretation of it you know maybe that'll change down the line um with improv no with stand-up uh you know because you can it requires a little bit of a setup like you have to have a grounded setup uh something that's either relatable or something that just sets the tone and that's like a requirement in improv um so uh just getting in that different mentality that's that's been really good and I appreciate a lot of that you know just what I've learned throughout it yeah I think Naomi is like super good at improv just because she's not she doesn't she's never done like anything else so for her she just acts normal Mm. of course she like starts a British accent a lot of the time for no reason yeah it's like hello chat yeah do this um but yeah it's just kind of like letting I don't know I like what Dave Dave is super helpful just like let the funny come like let the funny will come just kind of like play it out naturally Mm mm-hmm yeah, and that's that's been a good tool, just because you know when you're I, I'm funniest when I'm not trying to be funny, mm-hmm. and uh, that that helps out a lot because like you know you don't I, I I mean even in this interview I'm not that funny right now, mm-hmm. but like my goal is my fear was that if I inter, if I have a comic on they pro, they try to be funny I'm like I don't want that at all that's yeah yeah. yeah yeah it's I don't know I don't. Every, I, I used to try to be funny all the time. Like, I mean, like, I was making jokes. Like, I mean, like, house parties, like, I would always, I would always make jokes. And then as soon as I started doing stand-up, I didn't really feel the need to do that because, like, it wasn't, I was getting that, you know, I was getting that. Uh, the validation? Yeah, yeah, basically, like, that validation that, like, I would seek. And, you know, once, uh, once I really sought after I didn't need it as much in my personal life I, I definitely need it uh, do you let people know you're a comic when you first meet them if they ask like what do you do you're like ah, I do stand up or what, what do you say I try to wait <laughs> to tell people same I've had enough people like say like tell me a joke hate it oh it's terrible and I've had I, I used to work at Pie Hole uh, and you know when people would recognize me from shows uh, they'd say like, oh, uh, I saw you. And then like someone behind them in line, they're like, oh, you're a comic. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, tell me a joke. And they wouldn't tip. 
Like, I mean, like... <laughs> That's hilarious. It, it's like, what the hell? Like, I mean, like, I'm doing this. I'm I'm showing out. And you're like, dance, monkey, dance. And it's like, all right. It really is. Someone told me, um, he was like, I did a stir crazy mic with him. And afterwards, we got drinks. And he said, like, I don't never, I like, he's like, I don't let people know I'm a comic because then they treat me like a joke. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, maybe like a bit exaggerated, but an extent, yes. Because I feel like, I would much rather it's fun just enjoying you knowing you're you're just like a funny person Mm -hmm. and then without because like once they have an expectation for you to be funny I feel like it's like you working out a bit is this a joke like I'm just talking chill out yeah yeah and I I get that for sure like I mean I sometimes it's good you know just because it's like oh this is like what I do in my free time because like everyone's like oh like you know it because it is a it's a large part of my life and it does let me connect a little bit like I put it on my resume I try to be open about it but you know if I'm if I'm just hanging out with someone for the first time I'm probably not gonna let them know well yeah they can just follow me on IG yeah <laughs> and then just say like oh you're at Improv Mania next week yeah, yeah. no definitely I think um, well, that's cool man what is it uh, what are you excited about right now oh I'm just excited for the future you know I'm trying to like I said, I'm trying to figure shit out, but mm-hmm. um, I think it's it's good and it's exciting. Uh, it's a fun time to be young. Uh, Not so, like World War Two. Everyone no, was on edge. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I, I would die in war. I don't think I'd. I, I wouldn't do very well. You hear uh, Dirk Nowitzki? Like he said, like he, before the NBA, he's actually going to enlist in war. And then Charles Barkley, like, what the fuck is seven foot? Of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> seven foot going to do in a war. <laughs> Oh, I love the inside of the NBA group. They're so funny. Yeah, just, yeah what would you do before? You're fucking seven foot. You can't do it. <laughs> when you hide in the bunkers. Hide in the bunkers. When you squat, you're like five foot ten. Like He's dropping rocks. Oh, shit. He's dropping rocks on the enemy just from downtown in like an unorthodox fashion. <laughs> Did you see his footwork on yeah, yeah. through that rock? France wasn't, they wouldn't know what to do. They just got Tony Parker. He's just dishing assists. Yeah, Tony Parker. Uh, did you watch his documentary on um, Netflix? I haven't seen it yet, no. It's so, like, you don't understand how nasty this guy was. Oh, like, yeah. He, he would be a 97 in 2K. Like, that's, yeah. that felt like, when they had it. But, like, he was, um with the France team, he was messing up the USA. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, that kind of just put in perspective, like, how good and how much of a phenomenon he is. It's just, like, how people in the U.S. don't really understand, like, how big these K-pop stars are. Like, these people have the whole nation behind them that we never, we don't pay attention to. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Yeah, and no, all that, that's the first dynasty. That, that's, like, incredible to me because, like, you got Tim Duncan, uh, you know, Manny Ginobili, mm-hmm. Tony Parker, and, like, they just did their thing. You know, they it's not, it, playing out of San Antonio... That's that's such a small market. Like how how the hell does San Antonio get a franchise? You know, even though they won five chips, they talked about moving San Antonio, like the Spurs, to the Vegas. I'm like, why? Like yeah. <laughs> but uh, I feel like it's a good it's a it's a good you have to be very selfless to thrive there. That's why um, I maybe that's why Demar Derozan was like so out of the, out of the NBA media. Then he came back. Now he's just a killer on the Bulls. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, they didn't have a lot of pieces. You know, I love Drew Eubanks, but, you know, when he's your starting center, that's a... I think I think he could be, like, an Ivaka uh, or Vichas Zubats. Who, wait, what are you saying? Vichas Zubats. I can't pronounce it. Just say Zubak. Word. Yeah, Zubats. Zubas. That's how you, yeah, that's how you pronounce it. They got the little tilde over the seat. It's a, I don't even know that. I thought that was an accent. No, uh, maybe, but... But, uh, but I love it. Man, you still a hooper, though? I haven't been hooping much lately. I get nervous. Play hoops with uh, Reese. Yeah, yeah. He told you? Yeah. He got punched in the face. Yeah, yeah. And he doesn't stop bringing it up. <laughs> he, I, I would. I would milk that shit. Yeah, it would. The day I die. Yeah. At least he's not super mad about it. At least I don't think. Oh, Reese gets buckets, though. He does. He's surprisingly in shape. Yeah, no, he's, he's, a, good, he's a good hooper. I run and I feel like I taste blood. Like, yeah. that's how out of shape I am. Yeah, I. that's why I haven't been hooping much lately. I just don't. I'm not, I'm not there. It's just too painful to start. Yeah. What is a, so it's going to wrap this up. Say you see this in 10 years. Um, what do you want to say to yourself? Get the job. <laughs> Fade to black.